Hey, everybody. Welcome to the first ever episode of Towing the Slab, pitching with me, David Cohn. Also, we've got Justin Shackle and James Smythe here to kind of, uh, one's a point guard, one's going to uh, kind of fill in the blanks for me, as he always does, uh, as, as we do Yankee games together. And uh, we're going to still deal with some current issues as as well as what's going on in the championship series in Boston with a route tonight over Houston. And then also talking about baseball's first, you know, st- scoring first, the first inning for starting pitchers, everything that happens right out, out of the gates that, that are, they're that so impactful in, in the course of a game. But uh, nonetheless, welcome to our first show. Yes. Episode one, toe on the slab pitching with David Cohn. You just heard David. I'm Justin Shackle. Like you mentioned, James Smythe in the house as well. James, what's going on, man? Hey, good to be here. We're, we're finally kicking off the first episode. Yeah, Maiden Voyage, where we talk about pitching. You know, we look to find clarity between some of the new techniques in the analytic age and how that can mesh with the heartbeat of an athlete. And today, like David alluded to, we're talking about some themes that we've seen this postseason as it relates to pitching, themes that happen early on, and themes that happen in the first inning. But uh, David, like we said, it's your podcast, man. Congratulations. And I, I think you celebrated by hitting the links today, right? Yes, the Yogi Berra Golf Tournament. Uh, it's a great cause. Yogi's got a museum down at Montclair State University. And, you know, we, we've done it for years. Uh, it's, you know, Yogi used to play in it. Now his family's kind of carrying on the tradition. So, you know, it's Yogi Berra. I mean, how, you know, he, he's one of the uh, – one of the, the players that transcended the game, right? There's there's little old grandmothers that have heard of Yogi Berra that don't know anything about baseball. So to, to me, that's kind of the barometer when you when you have that kind of fame. Yogi Yogi's a transcendent sort of a figure in American history. We hope those little old grandmothers know exactly how to subscribe to podcasts because uh, that's rule number one right out of the gate. Rate, review, subscribe, right? All that podcast jargon that everyone's heard a million times. Well, now we get to say it. And uh, we hope that you do all those three rate review subscribe it is uh the best way to make sure that you know we're we're setting out our our goals and doing everything that we uh, we promise with you so yes rate review subscribe new episodes coming out every tuesday here how's your golf game going david it was like the first real day of fall you had a lot of wind that, that was a factor as well how's your golf day game? Today. let me tell you it was cold out there it was the first uh cold day we've had this year even though it wasn't temperature wise but outside it was windy in jersey today it was, it was blowing down there and it was bone chilling you know, for the first feel of uh, that that north wind it certainly got us all a little bit out there today all right, we're off and running with this podcast in october like the best time of the year to obviously talk about baseball but pitching it's more specific because we know pitching dictates the postseason and we're seeing it again. We're right in the middle of the ALCS and the NLCS. We're recording at the time where the ALCS just wrapped up in game three. The Red Sox took down the Astros 12 to three, the final, a no contest after the first three innings or so. And I think it's a good indicator of our topic here. A lot of stuff is happening early on in these games and it's really leaving some teams in shambles when you look at their pitching staff so through three games what do both boston and houston's pitching staffs look like we have a a really clear answer right now the astros don't look too good boston thanks to the emergence of eduardo rodriguez tonight you know he, he pitched a quality start in the postseason that's like as rare as a maddox in the regular season it it really puts the Red Sox over the top here. But, David, what has stood out to you in terms of pitching throughout this postseason, both the American League and the National League? You know, you know, I, I think the theme of this show was going to be, you know, the, the first, the first of things uh, to come. Uh, you know, for me, a starting pitcher, the first day was always the most difficult one. You know, I thought in tonight's game, even though both teams did not score in the first inning, there was a statement made by Eduardo Rodriguez how sharp he was how good his pitches looked, including that backdoor cutter that he throws. When he's got command of that cutter to both sides of the plate, it changes the whole equation for him because he can throw it in any count at any time. And it's unpredictable because it's in and it's out. It's more of an East and West style of pitch. And, uh, you know, for him, uh, the, you know, once he gets a feel for that, you can say, oh, he's on, he's on tonight. You could see early with Eduardo that he was on. And, uh, 
certainly the Boston offense, the way they're swinging the bats, that gives a pitcher a lot of confidence as well. But when you're coming out of the bullpen in a big game like that, whether you're the home pitcher or you're the visitor's pitcher, there's two different sets of circumstances. For the home style pitcher, you dictate the pace. You warm up before the game. You have your routine. And then you get to start the game based on your schedule. And it is your schedule, even though Major League Baseball will post a time before the game and say, game time 7-10. Well, the game doesn't start until the starting pitcher throws the first pitch. So the starting pitcher on the home team has that advantage. The starting pitcher on the visiting team has to sort of time his warm-ups before the game and kind of make sure that he doesn't sit down and get too cold before the top of the first is over. And then you can pitch the bottom of the first. So to me, that's what I always pay attention to. That's what I remember from, from pitching, uh, you know, a lot of big games was but getting out of the gates, first blood, getting your team off to a good start, allowing your team to score first. How do you translate your warm up from the bullpen to the game mound? We call it a fresh skin. You know, it's sort of the game mound where there's no spike marks on it. You've got to dig out your holes in the rubber, toe in the slab, as we say, and then get your alignment right. To me, is everything for a pitcher, and it sets the tone for the entire night. So, you know, maybe, maybe I harp on this a little much, and if you've heard me broadcast Yankee games, I talk about this a lot. But really, that first inning is the toughest inning for a starting pitcher, and it really sets the tone, and you can really get a read early on on what, what's going to happen that night and, and how sharp the pitcher's going to be. Yeah, Eduardo Rodriguez threw six innings. He gave up three runs, no walks, and seven strikeouts. And you mentioned the scoreless first inning. It looked really clean on paper. If you were watching, though, I think a huge point in this game was the – second batter of the game with Michael Brantley. And it was a key strikeout, uh, that cutter that you mentioned on the outside corner. It was on a two and two count. Rodriguez didn't get the call on the previous pitch. It was really close. And then he came back and nailed the spot for the strikeout. And then uh, Devers made, made a nice stop on a, a hard Bregman ground ball that led to a perfect first inning, but getting that strikeout call, the swing and miss and that strikeout of Brantley. I think that that's at the tone for Rodriguez here. And, there was the big question. If he could be effective and consume innings, he could be the big X factor of this series now because you pair him with Evaldi. You have two conventional starting pitchers, right? Grabbing innings, minimizing the workload for the bullpen. And it's like the polar opposite of where the Astros are going through now where Jose Urquidy lasted just five outs. I think the, the big stat that jumps out at you tonight, Rodriguez, six innings pitched in game three. The rest of the Houston starters, five and a third innings this entire series. Yeah, it's so true. And I know, you know, James and I talk about this a little bit during the broadcast that we work together on the Yes Network. But, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's you know, with Rodriguez, you talk about swings and misses. You know, that, that's kind of the first thing we look at is, is it gives you a read on the, on the stuff. It's not just about strikeouts. It's how many pitches is he throwing? What kind of command he, does he have? And how many swings and misses is he getting on all of his – all of his pitches, how broad in scope is, 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 uh, is his stuff playing and how well is it playing on any given night? And, you know, for me, Eduardo Rodriguez is kind of a momentum pitcher. You know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a different term that I use, but you could see that he, once he gets on a roll, he starts throwing all of his pitches for strikes, especially feeding off of that cutter. He kind of pitches off of that cutter to both sides of the plate. Well, when he gets on a roll, he throws strike after strike. You can almost see his body language on the mound, the human element comes into play to where his confidence takes over and he just starts filling up the strike zone and just getting, getting on top of the hitters. And to me, that's the key. When you're in attack mode as a pitcher and you could feel it, you can sense it working fast on the mound, throwing strikes with all of his pitches. And he got on top of that lineup. And then once they gave him six runs in the bottom of the second to work with, well, it just seemed like, you know, that it, it was, that was going to be enough for him tonight. Yeah. It never hurts to have a, another grand slam from a, a leadoff hitter like Kyle Schwarber. I want to touch on that in a few moments. Let's look at the NLCS here. Dodgers seem to be in a little bit of trouble here. They, you know, they're, they're trailing in this series now and the Braves are up 2-0 going to Los Angeles. So they've ensured themselves that this series is going to end in Atlanta. And there's a lot being made over the Dodgers decision to have Julio Arias come out out of the bullpen and the Dodgers kind of pivoting in, in their late game setup with a 4-2 lead using Arias against the Braves lefty hitters after a lot of context that's built into that. But what did you make of, of that decision, David? 
I think it's easy to second guess it now because it didn't work. Uh, you know, Arias has relief experience, at least in the past. And he's that type of a pitcher where he loves to have the ball. I'm sure once they told him about it, he was all for it. it I'm sure there was not any reluctance. Um, you know, if you compare or contrast that uh, to uh, maybe the Yankees plan of an opener uh, last year with, uh, you know, Debbie, Davy Garcia starting the first inning, then Jay Happ reluctantly coming in in the second inning and watching him warm up before that particular game, there was no buy-in from it. So I think, I think you, you, the Dodgers had full buy-in from Arias. I don't think it just, I just think it just didn't work out in that particular game. And that's so easy to second guess. You know, uh, the fact that it didn't work out, he's a starter, you got him out of his routine. Well, you know, he's a pitcher first. You're a pitcher first and it's the postseason. And you, you're willing to do anything at that point. And he's done it in the past. So, you know, I, I think the Dodgers think outside of the box. They're obviously analytically driven, you know, and, and James could probably get into this a little bit more in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the strategies as they change and from, from regular season to postseason and how the managers uh, manage a little bit differently in the postseason. But, but certainly, you know, uh, I, I didn't have a problem with it at the time, and I'm reluctant to second-guess it now just because it didn't work. Well, Urias, uh, he has experience starting and relieving. He was great in the postseason last year uh, for the Dodgers during their championship run, and he closed out um, the series against the Rays. And he was used to some unconventional usage just in the, in the previous series. Um, the, la the, the last minute switch to Corey Knabel um, before uh, to make the start in game five. And, uh, and Urias came in after Knabel and Bruce Dar uh, Gratterall and pitched a, a great uh, four innings in San Francisco for uh, to really key the, the Dodgers win there in, in game five. And the one issue I would have is, and you saw it a little bit with Max Scherzer um, last night in game two in Atlanta, uh, does it, how much does it compromise the starter for their next game? So Scherzer slammed the door in game five and he was not, he was not right uh, last night. And he kind of had a little bit of an early exit than you'd expect for a, a future hall of famer like Scherzer. And he's, and he said it, it, you know, it changes preparation and it, it, it was a, it was an issue for him there. And now how does last night's appearance change for Urias going into the next game, his next scheduled start, whether it's game four or game five. See, that's what I'm hung up on. Scherzer, you know, you can't nitpick because look, they they had him pitch the ninth inning in a game five. They were leading two to one. Do what you need to do to get to the next round, right? In Arias's case, he threw 59 pitches in that game on Thursday. He had the two days of rest. Apparently, he told the the front office during the game five celebration over San Francisco. Again, he's available. Any role at any time. I think, David, that goes back to your point. You know, you're a pitcher first. You're going to have that mindset. But you have to factor in Blake Trinan needing only nine pitches to get through that that seventh inning in his uh, second day of work. And you have Arias slated to start game four. So, like, my biggest question is all this, and I know he's worked in relief in the past, and if it works, you know, we're not talking about it. But it didn't work. And and it's not the only example. I know, David, you mentioned Jay Happ, Davia Garcia. That's that's an example that, you know, hits closer to home for us, all our ties with the Yankees. You know, you look at the Rays and Shane McClanahan earlier this postseason. Again, he had experience in the past working out of the bullpen, not this season. And I get wanting the matchups, but what do you think teams are are so willing? Why are they so willing to put pitchers in largely unfamiliar roles during the most important games of the postseason? Where has the trust gone in these situations? These are valid points. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 well, and well stated on both your parts, you know, James and Justin. Um, it makes you wonder the overall strategy with the Dodgers, in particular with the Dodgers, just to kind of nail down to the heart of the matter here. Uh, Maybe they're, they're going to go with an opener again. Maybe they feel like they can limit the pitcher at bats offensively with the non-DH games against the National League teams, you know, where the pitcher only is hit once. Uh, maybe they see a real benefit there. Maybe they also see the benefit in, you know, maybe continuing on with that opener strategy. Maybe Urias doesn't actually get a clean start in his next outing. Maybe they do opt for Blake Trinan or somebody else. 
to open, somebody like that to open the game for them again. So it makes me wonder that the Dodgers are up to something. Uh, if there's a chance to get a platoon advantage, if you can flip flop a lineup early, if, the, if there are, are teams that, that really rely on maybe more of a platoon situation like the Rays or, or, uh, or, or like or the that. Giants. Or the Giants, exactly. That, that's probably why the strategy was, was so appealing to the Dodgers in, in that category or in that situation because they could really put the pressure off the opposing team on lineup construction and mess with them a little bit early and force their hand a little bit early. So, yeah, it feels like there's a lot of chefs in the kitchen with the Dodgers, right? There's a lot of analytical information. There's a lot of top to bottom. And I think one of the most interesting – statements and one of the most honest statements came, came from from Dave Roberts who said you know he admitted he, he used the term tippy top you know these decisions are coming from the tippy top on down and he's one of the first managers that have ever said that and even admitted he said he said I have a vote but that's all I really have I have one vote here this is the knights of the round table you know that, that's my expression uh, that, that that make these decisions so kind of makes you wonder what the Dodgers are up to I get that like you know, organizations don't care what the aesthetics are with winning, right? They, they want to get to the bottom line. And, and with that, it feels like each pitching staff is kind of in a bind right now. It's a war of attrition. The postseason's become a war of attrition. When you look at the Dodgers, though, they have like the three starting pitchers that you would typically search for in the postseason, Arias and, and Bueller and Scherzer. So then they do some stuff like this and you were like, why, you know, like their overthinking is making me feel like I'm overthinking. And I can't be the only one, especially when you see right on the other side of the field, what the Braves are doing. Like, what do you think about some of the teams that are still trying to employ their starting pitchers, the conventional way we saw with the Braves and you you saw in, in game three with the Red Sox. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's an excellent point and very debatable. I mean, that, that's, what, that's why people have podcasts, right? So we can talk about these <laughs> issues and, and debate them. Um, to, you know, for some time, you know, there's an expression, you know, when I played for the Mets uh, back in the 80s and Davey Johnson was the manager and Buddy Harrelson was, was uh, the, the third base coach. Uh, and they talked about it's so tempting to overmanage. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just get out of the way and let the players play and, and then adjust as you go. And, you know, that's to your point, Justin, maybe, you know, when you have a massive staff of analysts that the Dodgers employ, uh, it's hard for them not to analyze, right? Analysts are going to analyze and they're going to, they're going to have their two cents in, in, in there. And it's hard not to try to, to, leverage your resources and use every angle you can to come up with some sort of an advantage. And that's understandable. That's what they're there for. That's what they're, they're built to do. But you're right, Justin, that it is debatable that in a big game, maybe it's, it's, maybe we just get out of the way and, and let the game take over and then adjust as we go. That, that's, that's one strategy that the first time I heard that was from Davey Johnson, who was one of the, the early progressive first managers with a computer on his desk, kind of a guy back in the eighties and early nineties who actually looked at numbers and matchups and tried to get ahead of the curve and get, get any edge he could, but sometimes you can't overplay your hand at times. I like how you're pointing back to your time with the Mets, David, because it just creates a beautiful segue here. And I obviously, you know, we're talking about teams scoring first this postseason. That's the, the main theme of our, our first episode. And for a pitcher, what it means to get over the hump in that first inning, so to speak. So I want to ask you, David, what is the significance of October the 5th, 1988 to you? Oh, geez. October the 5th, 1988. Uh, geez. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sick. You know, 1988, I think about facing the Dodgers in the playoffs, you know, because, you know, back then there wasn't a wild card and there was, it was like, right. Boom. You go right to, right to the uh, seven round series and then right to the world series after that. So uh, I, certainly I, I remember uh, an eventful Dodger series that was up and down. And I remember uh, learning some hard lessons, you know, in that particular series. And, uh, you know, I, I still think back to 1988 as a missed opportunity for the Mets. One, the one that we let it get away. You're in the neighborhood. It was uh, it was game two of the NLCS. It was your first ever 
postseason game. And it was at Dodger Stadium, uh, game two, NLCS. Do you remember, I mean, postseason, you know, you make 21 appearances, 18 starts in your postseason career, but do you remember what was going through your mind as you got closer to making that first pitch in that first postseason game? Yeah, you know, it really reminds me that and I think maybe the Tampa Bay Rays ran into this a little bit with their great young pitchers, but lack of experience and experience does matter in big, especially in big games, because everything's so magnified. Every pitch matters. Every every, every hitter just grinds out every at bat. So, yeah, I remember being extremely nervous. Uh, there were some extenuating circumstances with with my particular first start on October 5th, 1988 is. I had done a ghost written column with Bob Clappish and uh, it, it became bulletin board material for the Dodgers. So once I found that out before the game, that made me even more nervous. And that was one of the first times that I walked out to do, to pitch the first inning where my legs were physically heavy. I mean, nerves clearly were, uh, were impacting me at that point. And, you know, certainly I've been nervous before and, you know, the, the, you know, I guess you could say, you know, I choked here and there in certain games or let the pressure get to me. I think every athlete does. But that was the one game I can only physically I can remember physically being inhibited from nerves. Uh, you know, it, that it, 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 it was a big impact on my performance in that game. Well, what was different about subsequent postseason starts? Uh, I, you know, I think once you've gone through through something like that and then you, you come out the other end uh, and, you know, the next game, game six, I came back and pitched a good game and, and kept us in the series. I think that that kind of uh, was a, a growing experience for me on the human element side. There's no substitute for experience. There's no um, there's only so many lessons you can learn uh, from pitching coaches or from videos or from analytics. Certain lessons you have to learn for yourself on the mound in the heat of the battle out there and. You, you get what I call kind of a light bulb effect that, you know, hey, I can do this. This this pitch works or this sequence works or I, I'm good enough to get this done. And, you know, the, sometimes that's all it takes. It's just an opportunity and a chance. But until you go through it, until you warm up in the Dodger Stadium bullpen before the game and, and hear the fans yelling at you, until you get on that mound in the first inning and face a lineup and, and feel the butterflies of, of the first of, of, of everything – but you, you can't really understand what it feels like because you've never been through it. And, and if you've never been through it, then you're susceptible to, to mistakes. You're susceptible to, uh, you know, not being at your best. Yeah, James, this postseason, we're learning a lot, right? Like there's a lot of momentum to be gained within the first inning on both sides of the ball and in being the team that scores first. So as of... Tuesday morning, you know, after this game three ALCS, the team who scores first this postseason, they are 18 and six. What else are we are we learning through some stats that you don't really need to dig deep to find, you know, in terms of context? What are we what are we learning about the first inning in these games? Well, right. And just a little context on the 18 and six. Uh, typically, the team that scores first wins about two out of three. Uh, you know, during the regular season. So with this year, it's even a little a little bit higher because it's more like three out of four uh, with an 18 and six record. But if we just look at the first inning in this postseason and compared to years past and, and regular season play, um, the first inning, the, the old adage, oh, you got to get them early, got to get them in the first inning. That's a real thing. Um, the The first inning has more run scoring at a higher rate than then about 10% higher than the rest of the game from the second inning on. So the first inning, you get, you get more runs. Now that could be some unfamiliarity with the pitcher. David, you could, you can, you talked about that with the, with the home pitcher versus the road pitcher. It's also the one inning where you can guarantee that uh, the, here are my three batters that I want to send up to the plate. So you're facing a higher caliber hitter than you might face in the second or third inning when you're facing the bottom of the lineup. So the run scoring is higher. The ERA in the first inning is about a half run higher generally o- over the years, about a half run higher than it is overall. Um, this year, the first inning ERA in the postseason through uh, game three of the ALCS uh, through Monday night's action is 5.25. It's a 5.25 ERA across all 24 games 
uh, so far in the in the MLB postseason. The overall ERA after that is 4.12. So you have more than a run higher on on the first inning ERA. So there's there's a big jump this year. It, it, could part of it be some uh, less experienced pitchers um, like uh, Shane Shane Boz in the uh, in the um, ALDS, he gave up a couple runs early, but then even a veteran like Chris Sale gives it right back with five runs, including the uh, Jordan Luplo Grand Slam. We saw really established star pitchers uh, get burned, most, uh, most maybe most significantly in our neck of the woods with uh, with the Yankees losing in Fenway. Uh, Garrett Cole couldn't get at couldn't get through that first inning unscathed with the two run homer to Xander Bogarts, uh, even Walker Bueller. The uh, the first the first inning of that great Dodger Giant series, Buster Posey, Oppo, almost hit into the into the cove. We hit it on a bounce, big two run shot there. So and then we even saw it in this series, the uh, the the Red Sox Astros series, um, with JD Martinez um, hitting the grand slam um, the other day in Game Two. So it really is, um, it's almost like no one no one's getting away unscathed. So we have star pitchers like Cole and Bueller, uh, younger, less experienced pitchers like Boz and uh, Garcia. Drew Rasmussen gave up a big home run to Kyle Schwarber too. Um, so I, I think it's uh, you're seeing a, a lot more scoring in the first inning uh, this year. Yeah, I was able to get this down on my own. Um, pat myself on the back here. You had 11 pitchers making their first ever postseason start this year, and. You know, the, the ERA doesn't jump out at you. They, it's a combined 3.58 ERA, but they're averaging fewer than four innings of work. Some did get touched up in the first inning, obviously. But, David, how, how often did those championship teams that you were on stress the importance of scoring first to one another? Uh, we talked about it a lot. It was a rallying cry for a lot of teams in the dugout as you're talking to each other, as you're talking smack, you know, trying to pump each other up. That's one of that's one of the things you'd hear, you know, first blood, give us give us a chance, shut them down, shut them down. I can, I can still hear Keith Hernandez, shut them down the first, Coney. We're, we're going to get them. We're going to score first. We're going to we're going to win this game. And, you know, even though sometimes there's no rhyme or reason to it, you're just it's just banter in the clubhouse or banter in the in in the uh, in the you know, in the dugout, I think it really does come down to just, you know, first, it's not only just the first inning, it's the first strike. How about 0-1, you know, 0-1 as opposed to 1-0. I mean, baseball is kind of a thing, kind of a, got a thing for first. Uh, you know, I don't have, you know, this is where I like to combine the, the human side with the analytical side. I can give you from experience, my feeling, how I felt emotionally pitching the first inning, really my whole career, you know, and even more importantly, early in my career to the Dodger game, you mentioned, you know, back in 1988 and the nerves and everything that goes with that. There's just something about, you know, for a starting pitcher, you wait a week to pitch, you know, there's 162 games in a major league season. I got to pitch in 30 to 35 of them. I got to play 30 to 35 times. The rest of the time I was sitting around watching games and watching other pitchers. So, uh, that anxiety builds up over the course of four or five days and you warm up before the bullpen and you're anxiety ridden, wondering how my stuff is, is my curveball breaking today? How's my control? How's my stuff in the bullpen? Especially younger pitchers really worry about that. You know, boy, do I have my good fastball today? And then when you take it out to the mound to warm up on a completely new mound, the fresh skin, as I said before, I reiterate that, but it's a real thing. You know, pitcher pitchers are mechanics, you know, uh, We've got to dig out holes. We've got to get our alignment uh, right. Uh, where am I landing? I've got to get the perfect landing spot, dug out just a little bit in front of the rubber. I've got to where, where I place my foot, my foot and my toe, where I'm towing the slab, where I push off of the rubber. You know, all these things really matter. And then when you start all over after having just warmed up in a bullpen before the game and then going out to that new mound, it takes some time to get a feel for it. A lot of times the bullpen mounds are facing in a different direction than the game mounds. You know, people talk about wind uh, affecting fly balls and home runs. Well, wind affects pitches too. If it's a crosswind at home plate, how windy the day is. If I was throwing into the wind at Candlestick Park, my pitches dove like crazy. My curveball broke 10 feet, you know, uh, it, it, with, with the wind conditions. So that's another thing you have to gauge for a pitcher and, that just adds to anxiety in the first inning that, that uh, all these thoughts through your head. I waited a week to pitch. 
I've got to be right. And then I've got to get all the mechanics right. And I've got to get my, my mound right. And then I've got to gauge the wind and, and, and the, the effects. And then who's the umpire behind home plate? Can I steal some pitches? Is he going to call the pitch just off the plate? What's his strike zone look like? So all of these things are first that you're finding out in the first inning that lead to me uh, to an advantage for the hitter. The hitter has the advantage because, as James said, the best hitters nowadays, especially in today's modern lineups, the best hitters are your first three hitters. You know, there's no mistake about it. They're, they're, they're not your fourth or fifth or sixth hitters uh, where the power guys used to be in the middle of the order. Uh, it's those guys, those guys are ready to go from the first pitch on. Yeah. I mean, you have, <laughs> this is very different from facing like what Joey core, Kenny Lofton, right? Like this is Mookie Betts. This is Kyle Schwarber, Randy Arosa, Randy. You have guys that are powering out to lead off a game. How different would your approach be if you're facing that caliber of a leadoff hitter? Yeah, if you're worried about the first pitch of the game leaving the ballpark, that's not a good thing for the pitcher. It's a good thing for the offense. You know, uh, there were, I can't tell you how many games I pitched in the 80s and even in the 90s where my first pitch of the game was right down the middle. Let's just get a strike here. I don't have to really worry about it. There was maybe a, a speed burner or maybe a Vince Coleman type of leadoff hitter that was even going to spot me a strike because he wanted to walk or he was he was trying to get on base any way he could. And that's not what Kyle Schwarber's trying to do. <laughs> he's, try, he's trying to leave the ballpark on the first pitch. So if you try to throw that get me over fastball down the middle, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna get burned. Uh, you know by by these type of lineups that you see nowadays. The power in the game certainly both the pitching power, the depth of power arms in the bullpens now. That's why you're seeing starting pitchers throw less and fewer innings because there's more choices, more better pitching. There's more power arms. You know, James and I were doing a game uh, earlier this year, and, it, you know, Aaron Boone had uh, Jonathan Loisega in the game, and he had Clay Holmes warming up. And I, and I said to James, I said, well, they're going to take out the guy who throws a 99-mile-an-hour sinker to bring in the guy that throws a 99-mile-an-hour sinker. I mean, that's, that's what you're dealing with nowadays. You know, the, these type of arms, this type of power in the bullpens has really changed the way the game is managed and the way the game is played. You're talking about a lot of the things that goes through a pitcher's mind when you surrender that early run in that first inning. And we can call this like the age of matchups, right? Teams are so locked in on trying to have that pitcher being able to negate that hitter's skills and, and just matching it up. So like when you're surrendering that early run or two and all those things that you listed that you could be thinking at that moment, were you ever thinking like, well, I'm probably not going to be seeing that part of the opposing lineup again a second time around or third time around? Like, did, did something like that ever cross your mind when you're pitching in the first inning? No, not, not for me. You know, I, I was part of the last era of pitchers that were allowed to throw 130 to 140 pitches on a regular basis. Uh, there were so many games I pitched where I, I was through five innings and around a hundred pitches where I thought, hey, I've got two more innings left here. You know, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm going to get through. I still got a chance to get through seven innings at a hundred pitches after five. You know, I did, I, I was going to throw 130, 135 pitches. These pitchers aren't going to be allowed to do that nowadays. It's just disallowed. They just, the managers would be fired if they allowed pitchers to do that on a regular basis. Uh, and they have more weapons in the bullpens. Uh, they have more pitchers, first of all, the way the rosters are constructed. All the extra players are in the bullpen, and rightly so. There's a lot of good pitchers down there to be used and to be, and to be had. So, no, to answer your question, Justin, I never thought about that. What I did think about, though, was how the other pitcher was throwing. And here's another sort of, you know, a perception that's out there that a lot of pitchers talk about. You know, I'm not facing the opposing pitcher. I'm facing the opposing lineup. Well, that's not necessarily true because if you give up two in the first inning and then you look across at the guy who's pitching and he looks really sharp tonight, you might have just lost the game in the first inning, really. If, if, the, if the pitcher's that good and that sharp and then they've, they've got a lockdown bullpen behind it, that's what I'm thinking about, you know, is that, uh-oh, you know, uh, this guy's sharp and I just gave him that much of an advantage to start this game off of. Yeah, like what's going on inside the head of the opposing guy, the opposing starter as he's – graced with a lead before even throwing that one pitch in a postseason game like how different 
is that feeling compared to the same situation in the regular season? It's, it's kind of twofold. First, it's comforting because you know you got a, a little cushion to work with. And secondly, the, the, there's a big responsibility with it. And everybody talks about shut down innings. Well, certainly there's a message to be sent to your team, you know, that, hey, you gave me two runs to work with in the top of the first. Now, uh, in the bottom of the first, I've got to go out there and a quick one, two, three inning is a great statement to make just psychologically for your team. You know, I can't put a number on that. I can't tell you from an analytic standpoint, you know, what that means. But I know psychologically what that means to not only the pitcher on the mound and having that shut down inning, but also to everybody in the lineup, everybody in the clubhouse, everybody in the dugout. When you walk back in that dugout after having a good, quick one, two, three shutdown inning and you've, you've already got a two run lead. Boy, the, the feeling in that in that in, uh, in, in that uh, dugout just jumps, and you it's palpable. You you can definitely feel that confidence starting to breed. I'll just blend this into you know the more positive tone when you're pitching a scoreless first inning, and we've seen that happen obviously in this postseason. We've seen what kind of tone that sets for certain teams. You saw it tonight, at, you know, Game Three of that Red Sox Astros series with Eduardo Rodriguez. James, how like how have teams fared in games where the pitcher tosses a scoreless first inning? Do do the numbers really stack up there? And and just overall with some of the big big name pitchers, maybe this this postseason, like where where do you think we're at once you get through that hump, that first inning obstacle? It's a little bit of a mixed bag because, and also we've had a a lot more games with the team scoring a first inning run. So a game like tonight with uh, Eduardo Rodriguez and uh, Jose Urquidy, uh, they actually pitched two, one, two, three innings in both halves of the top and the bottom of the first. So we, that's only the second time this postseason we've even seen that with Lance McCullers and Lance Lynn in the ALDS uh, in the white, in the white Sox Astros series. So it's almost like we don't really have much to go on because we, before we mentioned the five to five first inning ERA, they, we don't really have much of a, of a sample to go off of. Uh, but generally speaking, if you stretch it out a little more, uh, the, the records are uh, obviously in favor of, of, um, of, you know, you get that first, you get that first inning zero, you put that donut up and get the offense back out there and it's smooth sailing. Uh, Coney, uh, don't sell yourself short because your career ERA, 3.46. Career ERA in the first inning, 3.93, which is really totally fine considering that most pitchers have their ERAs go up by a half a run or more. So that's pretty much in the norm for uh, for, for pitching in the first inning. Uh, a lot of pitchers have – a lot of great pitchers have had a, a much bigger uh, issue in the first inning and, you know, between, you know, active pitchers that we've seen uh, this year, uh, Shohei Otani, Ian Anderson, Freddie Peralta, Luis Garcia, Garrett Cole, guys who have starred in the season and we've even seen them in the postseason too, where they've, they've had some shaky, uh, some shaky issues in the first. Um, Tom Glavin, so, Hall of Famer Tom Glavin used to, used to have a Glavin, big issue. Glavin is one of those guys. Mm-hmm. And uh, Greg Maddox was the same thing. Maddox, 3.16 career ERA, but 409 uh, in uh, in the first inning. So it's almost like he became a pedestrian pitcher. And then after he gets over the hump there, then he's Greg Maddox. And what's interesting to me is seeing that even throughout baseball history and as, you know, the ebbs and flows offense, errors of favor offense, errors of favor pitching. Um, two of the guys that I think that narrative really came on really strongly was um, Bob Gibson and Tom Seaver. And he's like, oh, with these, you know, the, the Hall of Fame type pitchers, the aces, you can only get them in the first. You have to strike before they really settle in. And even you see guys from, you know, a couple of generations ago, uh, Bob Gibson, 291, career ERA. First inning ERA, four on the nose. So that's a difference of more than a full run. And it's similar for Seaver, where he was just under uh, a full run increase from, the, from his career ERA to the first inning. It was 2.86 career and 375 in the first, uh, which is actually a little worse than it might seem because they pitched in a pitcher dominant era where ERAs were generally lower to begin with. So the, the, uh, the conventional wisdom 
of, uh, you know, needing to strike against these ace pitchers early before they settle in. That's true. And Tony, you, you mentioned this all the time. It's really great when you see now we have, now we have the numbers for it and it's stuff that always existed and it's stuff that's always been, you know, thought of in the game, but now it's like, Oh, that thing that everyone just assumes turns out it was actually right the whole time. And we just only now we have these kinds of things to back it up. Yeah, that, that's a great point, James, because there's more common denominators than you you think. You know, that we take we, this, this the narrative of, you know, old school and new school or analytics versus, you know, uh, you know, more of a field type of type of baseball. There's more common denominators than you think there are. And there's more things that can be, uh, you know, uh, explained like you just did, you know, and, and, and sort of, uh, you know, backed up, so to speak, uh, than, than you would think. Um you know, there's a lot of things that analytics have proved that, that a lot of old time baseball coaches have been talking about for years, you know, and then and, and, and then there's there's some things that, that buck, buck heads with it as well. But they go to completely counterintuitive to some of the old theories. But there's more there's more there than meets the eye and there's more common denominators than, than you'd expect. David, does one first inning of a postseason start stand out to you more than others over your career? Uh, you know, I think to me, I always felt like when you're the home starter, that that was something that was a little bit different, you know, and that you really could get the crowd into it early. And if you could come out of the gates and look sharp right away, the whole, you get everybody in the stadium into the game and you get a lot of intangibles going for you, whether that was the, you know, at the old Yankee Stadium, how loud they could be. If you could get a strikeout to end the, end the first inning and, and walk, you know, kind of walk on a cloud of air into the dugout, everybody was pumped up. I mean, that adrenaline that you get, that, that you can do yourself as a starting pitcher and, and the home starting pitcher to set the tone early, you know, it means something. Now, yeah, obviously, there's a lot of game to play. It's not everything. Things can be overcome. Um, it's just one inning. It's a small sample. But – Boy, what a great way to start out your night. Uh, you know, I, you know, there, there, there's a few games I remember, you know, starting the first inning at Yankee Stadium and just, wow, the crowd was going, just exploding. And, and then you get into the dugout and the team is fired up because they can sense that, hey, well, yeah, our starting pitcher's got his good stuff tonight. You know, let's go. Let's score. Let's get him some runs, guys. You know, one the, it goes hand in hand in terms of the psychological nature of how you feel collectively as a team. Well, how about um, how about the first game in the 95 ALDS at Yankee Stadium? It was the first postseason game for the Yankees since 1981. Uh, and it was a great run to the wild card and to sneak into the playoffs in the last weekend. And uh, to have a raucous Yankee Stadium, you're pitching the first inning. And looking at this right here, first inning. One, two, three. Vince Coleman, strikeout. Joey Cora, fly out. And then you got a guy named Ken Griffey Jr. to pop out. One, two, three on 11 pitches and into the dugout. Yeah, that, that, that's the answer I would have said. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> to answer Justin's question, yeah. That, that was as good as it gets. I mean, uh, it was, as you said, James, you framed it perfectly. And it was uh, Don Manningly, Donnie Baseball's only taste of postseason play as well so yeah that that one was was memorable without a doubt yeah that was uh that was the series that brought the old place uh, off the hinges the place was shaking pretty much every game that was wild that 95 series against the mariners and you know we look at this first inning now where how far we've come right david like you said you fall into some early trouble you're not even thinking about oh man, my time's going to be short here. I might have just sealed my fate. I feel like that has to creep into the pitchers that we're seeing today if they come uh, in, into some trouble in the first inning. It, it's the human part of the game, right? Like, man, I yeah, I probably just sealed my fate right here, even though maybe it was like one mistake. Take Ian Anderson the other night, and, and James, you brought him up. You know, he has a spotty resume in first inning of games, even through the regular season. For all intents and purposes, Ian Anderson, the other night in game two, he made one bad pitch and it resulted in a two-run homer from, from Corey Seager. And he ends up going three innings. 
if he does not make that one mistake pitch, is he going longer? Again, it's just one pitch. Like, does that personify the obstacle that is the first inning in this environment? Yes, definitely does. It's a great point, Justin. And uh, it, there's even more pressure nowadays on these pitchers because of exactly what you said. They know they're on pitch counts. They know that uh, the relievers are lined up. The lanes, so to speak, are, are lined up so that, you know, if you have uh, – a big pitch count in the first inning, and then you give up a couple of runs. Well, yeah, you're right. It could it could just uh, completely alter your entire evening or your your entire start. So, yes, uh, even more so nowadays. You know, back you know, if I was allowed to throw 130 pitches back in the 80s or 90s, then I'd have time to overcome it. You know, I could still get my stuff together. Or we can come back and score some runs. I've got a chance to really still stay in this game, but you know, not anymore. You know, that's that's just not the way it's going to be played nowadays. Not with all the weapons that these managers have in the bullpens. Do you think we've increased the toll in terms of what pitching in that first inning takes on you physically? Yes. You know, and James, James can add some flavor to this, but yeah, without a doubt it does. It puts even more pressure on these pitchers, uh, these starting pitchers. And also it kind of lends credence to the whole, opener strategy the whole opener strategy is based around a lot of these numbers that we've been talking about a lot of these these issues everything about the first inning has kind of made the opener strategy attractive uh to the analytics world and uh that's why even even uh the los angeles dodgers as you say are messing around with the opener strategy because they feel like maybe that's an advantage that they could that they they could use um you know and maybe be the edge they need to, to get over the hump yeah, and you mentioned with Anderson, um, well, one, he has a 3.58 ERA this year. In the first inning, 6.38. So that was a little bit of a red flag. And then Seeger hits the home run, two zip like that. And one thing that I guess didn't really come up a lot with, uh, with the talk around Anderson's start, but I think it's pretty significant. Maybe this is more of, a, of an off-season topic about, you know, the, the fight over the DH, universal DH, should the NL still have the pitcher's bat? But a big aspect of that was that Anderson, you know, you're in a quick 2 nothing hole, and then his batting order spot comes up, and you pinch hit for him because you're down 2 nothing. you got to try and get some offense back in the game. If, if there was a DH in the National League, like a lot of the talk is, is uh, increasing for that, you, you, you wouldn't have to pinch hit for him. And then maybe he's able to go back out there in the fourth or fifth inning and, and, and put up a couple of zeros like he did in the second and third inning after that. Um, the flip side, because, Coney, you mentioned, um, you know, the increased pressure on pitchers um, with shorter leashes. One flip side of it is you can kind of look at the other way for Eduardo Rodriguez. So going into the game they were talking about maybe Evaldi could be available for an inning out of the pen Pavetta could be uh used in an emergency and Rodriguez especially with a with a big lead as the game was getting into a blowout but he was able to get through six innings but is the mentality now just go out and let it rip and and we'll and we'll see what happens in the third fourth inning because Rodriguez he was throwing smoke in the in that first inning and at the top, Justin, you mentioned the uh, the strikeout of uh, Michael Brantley, who pretty impressive because he's one of the toughest guys in the league to strike out. But uh, Rodriguez, he's a mid nineties fastball guy. The strikeout was ninety five point eight miles an hour. That was the fastest pitch he's thrown this season. So that's maybe it's a, a factor of you know, uh, you know, not really holding anything back. And uh, and Coney, you can talk about you can talk about this uh, just the pure adrenaline. Of, of being in a packed house in the first inning of a postseason game. Absolutely. The, the human element, you know, it certainly comes through and uh, you could sense it from him, you know, and, and everybody feeds off of that. That's kind of what I was saying before that your whole dugout, your whole, your teammates feed off of that. They sense it. They see it. You saw it, James, and we, we can now follow along every pitch and get data on every pitch that's thrown in a big league game now by just going to baseball savant and, you can see you can see anything you want to know on, on every pitch, vertical, horizontal movement, spin rate, 
uh, vertical, whatever, whatever you want, uh, you, you can find it out. But you see a pitcher pitching with that enthusiasm and that kind of stuff and, and that kind of sharpness, too. I mean, it's one thing to, to get your adrenaline up and throw the ball harder. It's another thing to pinpoint it, to be sharp with it. It's like, yeah, I, I feel a little extra today. And also, I'm putting it right on the black at the knees. You know, that's when you really – you kind of uh, you get your teammates pumped up because everybody feeds off of that. They see that and they go, whoa, he's got it tonight. He's on, you know, as opposed to the the opposing feeling of you see a pitcher out there kind of nitpicking around, feeling for it in the first inning. And the next thing you know, you know, you're sitting on the bench or your teammates are going, is he going to shit the bed tonight? He's going to shit the bed. We're going to be in trouble. So, you know, that that's, uh, you know, it's just the opposite of that. It's like, whoa, this guy is sharp. He's on. He's feeling it. Uh, let's go. Let's get some runs. Let's get him a couple of runs because he's going to make it work. And we're going to win this game. I think that situation right there pretty much like epitomizes the state of pitching in the postseason in 2021, right? You have Eduardo Rodriguez throwing gas faster than normal. All the chatter on Twitter is like, well, maybe he was told to just grip and rip because he's probably only going two innings or he's not going to see the lineup a second time through. Like those are the thoughts that creep into your head. It's nice to see that he went six full innings, right? Like it's nice to see after that start that maybe it was the adrenaline and him being amped up for this start at a raucous Fenway, the crowd's going crazy, especially at the start of that game. But those are the things we kind of have to question now, or at least put them out there where, you know, teams are exploring and, and employing different strategies with matchups the way we've seen it unfold. It, you know, the, the the quality start in the postseason is kind of becoming an endangered species. Uh, I, I'm wondering, you know, what it's going to take to kind of tilt back into that direction. But, hey, fellas, we have like a whole offseason to to tackle those questions, right? We're uh, we're off and rolling. This, this could be a good place to, you know, maybe stop and – you know, figure out what we want to see next or what could happen next because you have, again, in the ALCS, you have one team right now pitching-wise set up pretty nicely in the Red Sox and on the other end with the Braves and the Dodgers, Atlanta, with those conventional starters, even though they had to do an unpredicted bullpen game in uh, in game two, they're still set up nicely because they have conventional starters. I think you're seeing which way I'm leaning. Yeah, but, uh, sure. But overall, I mean, hey, whatever gets the win gets the win at the end of the day. Uh, it, it, it's just uh, interesting to see so much of what we're uh, reminded of, you know, hundred plus pitches. Eduardo Rodriguez throws 97 pitches in game three. And you're, you're getting at the point where I'm look, looking at his pitch count, like, man, I'm cheering him on to get to a hundred just to, just to say that he could do it here. And uh, you know, it didn't happen, but Hey, six innings, three runs. Uh, we see, we see a quality start here in the postseason. And some of these teams are in a lot better shape than others on, on the pitching side. Makes it very interesting. It does. Yeah. Didn't the Braves used to play in Boston? Are we looking at like a, this franchise uh, battle going on here? Is it going to be the Braves and the Red Sox in the World Series? Wow. I mean, that, that was probably the last pick for a lot of people <laughs> you know, coming into this postseason. But, well, but those are the two teams that are playing the best right now. Yeah, and the, the, uh, the Braves did. Uh, play in Boston in the uh, the early part of their in the early part of their run. So uh, up until 19, uh, 19 through nineteen fifty two, they were in Boston, and then they moved to Milwaukee. They had a thirteen year run in Milwaukee, and then off to Atlanta. There you go. In Boston and Atlanta on October nineteenth, right now in the best shape in the postseason. Not too many people had that at the end of the regular season. Any you guys right, got anything know, else as we wrap up? It can, it can it can change in a heartbeat. You're right. The great the great thing with the momentum in this series is is in a seven game series. Look at the, the Braves riding high off the two walk offs. Walker Bueller, if he comes through with one big game and they get a win in game three, then the Braves can start to go. Uh oh, they they were up two zero on the Dodgers. They were up three one last year, and then that that can that worm can turn pretty quickly in a seven game series. And despite everything that this industry is going through with the pitcher, it still remains true. You're only as good as your next starting pitcher, right? That's true. So, you know, and how good he is in the first inning matters. <laughs> so we'll see. Pay attention. If you don't see the first pitch of the game, you can't see the whole game. So watch the first pitch of the game. It's important. And watch the first inning. 
Yes. Main message, if anything, in terms of taking away from our maiden voyage here on Toe in the Slab, don't be late. Get there for first pitch. Be in your seat for first pitch. Uh, remind everyone, new episodes released every Tuesday. Look out for possible bonus episodes as well as we navigate through October and uh, wrap up the postseason as we still have the World Series to come, obviously, and these championship series, they still have to play out. And rate, review, subscribe. You want to make sure that you don't want to miss any episodes. Best way to do that is to subscribe here to Toe in the Slab Pitching with David Cohn. Guys, we have like a bunch of different platforms from uh, from John Boy Media. The folks there are, are doing a terrific job getting us off the ground. Like we have our own YouTube channel. We have our own Twitter account, our own Instagram account. So we're we're hooked up on the Internet here. <laughs> um, I, you know, you, you want to follow the show everywhere you can. It's incredibly impressive what the people at John Boy Media are able to do with one specific stream and just spread it out at different avenues. So uh, any way you get your content here, uh, just make sure that you're consistent. Hit the subscribe button, rate and review, and uh, we will talk to you next week. But possibly, hey, you never know in October, right? Like you, like you mentioned, Walker Buehler could shove. Dodgers can go back two and two. This is pitching. You never know what's going to happen next. You may have a bonus episode coming your way. We'll, uh, we'll have to see. Guys, uh, it's been fun this first episode. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Nice job, James. Good to see you as always. See you thanks, next time. Enjoy the games, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.